into cybersecurity, there's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. Today is Friday, November 3rd, 2023. Welcome to episode number 487 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Osier. And over the next 45 minutes, this guy all jacked up on feeling good and caffeine, Marcus Kyler, Senfilis, Ed Williams, Frank heading to the airport to go down to B-Sides, Charleston, Jessica Contreras, not only IT with that blue badging, Robert Moss, L. Scott Munoz, my man, Jesse Johnson, Jenny Housley, b Set, Kimberly, the mod teams, Billy DP, my man, Ben dropping my name, Ray Tierney, a.k.a. Medusa Double X, Stephanie Strauss, Justin Rower, Sharice Lamb, <gasps> Sherry, we're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So what can you do with this information to drive cyber risk reduction for your organization this week, next week, next quarter, next year, three-year plan? Whatever it is, we are going to make it actionable for you and make it deliver value both for your stakeholders and for you professionally. And if you're looking to break into the industry, don't be like, oh, I'll find another stream. Nope, bump that butt dust off the bench, get comfortable, sit down, sit a spell, because you are going to be asked in any single job interview, how do you stay current in the industry? This right here, this is the answer. On top of that, we're going to be covering terminology, threat actors, the things you need to know to be effective in the industry. And on top of that, you see all these people over here streaming in tad. We got uh, Luke Canfield over on LinkedIn, Stephanie Strauss, Billy DP up in YouTube. We got first timers, long timers. Networking is valuable and we're dropping knowledge bombs on this stream all the time. So settle in. You are going to get value. Believe that. Okay. So don't sweat it. If you're new to the industry or looking to break in, we got you covered. Now, before I dig into the news, before I just drop all of this energy on you guys, I want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors. Start with my good friend, Eric Taylor and Barricade Cyber Solutions. Listen, y'all, pop up chat, not right now. Listen, Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive, massive issues for business owners and send dedicated hardworking business owners into turmoil. We're talking tummy troubles, y'all. Break glass, grab the pink stuff, Give it to the business owner. Tell them to go sit down while Barricade Cyber fixes the problems, okay? They know how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. Maybe you don't have an active incident. Maybe you're trying to build a cyber program brick by brick. But how do you do it if you don't have the expertise? Well, let me introduce you to Panopsi Security. Panopsi, a South Carolina-based business that I'm on the advisory board for, led by Brandon Poole and his team. What's up, Sherry, with the super chat? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Yes, we did, Sherry. Thanks so much for the super chat. Great to have you in chat right now. Love the badging. Looks good on you, Sherry. Check it out. Panopsi Security can come in and go through any depth of evaluation of your business, right? And look at your resources, your threat landscape, your current information security program maturity level, and then turn around. And here's where the real value is. Give you a tailored, you know, easy to follow uh, plan on how to go from where you are now to where you need to be. And bonus, how you can convey this and communicate it to your business 
stakeholders in order to be able to make them appreciate what it is that you need to do, how you need to do it, and how you're going to get it done. So Panopsi Security is definitely where it's at. All right. Also, anti-siphon training, but enough about them. We'll talk about them at the mid-roll. I want to remind you, first of all, I don't do any research or prep for this show, which might sound chaotic. And you're like, what the hell? What? Sorry, Kennedy. What are we doing? What are we doing, Jerry, if you don't prep? Here's the thing. I've worked in the industry a wicked long time. I have lots of opinions. Whatever stories are about to drop right here, don't worry. I got I got something for you on each of those. But that's a part of the fun of the show because I don't even know what the stories are today. Each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing like this one is worth half a CPE. So be sure to say hi in chat and document that you were here. Take a screen cap. You definitely want to get credit for it. Hashtag team live. If you're here live with us in chat, my man, Marcus Kyler, James McQuig and Amelia Garcia, they're all live in chat. Terrence Banks, they know what's up. Hashtag team live. Let me hear you. Now, if you're watching on replay, love the team replay comments. I see you all. You know, I go in there. You know, I touch the comments. Sometimes I reply back to the comments. Team replay, team replay are people too. Okay. And I love team replay, love incorporating them. Uh, to the extent that I can. So drop your team replay in the comments and don't sweat that. Also, if today is your first show and you're like, what is this guy on? First of all, this is all natural. There is no uh, <laughs> there's no pharmaceutical enhancements being done here. I don't have performance enhancing drugs uh, helping me deliver podcasts. I'm just jacked up on good times, Mountain Dew, and uh, French roast coffee, which if you'll excuse me, I'm going to take a hard slug of right now. Oh, my God. So good. So good. All right. Now, holler at me. Guys, it is Friday, which means we have uh, Grayson's joke of the week, uh, you know, uh, provided by James McQuiggan. James McQuiggan. Uh, Grayson's on sabbatical. So James McQuiggan has slid into the uh, Friday joke chair. I got a couple uh, zingers for you. Dad jokes, you're going to love them. That's what Fridays are all about. Love all the squad memberships coming in. You guys are good. Angie Yarbrough, what's cracking? Good to see you. Hey, Cindy. Excuse me. Hey, Cindy. Love it. Love that blue badging. All right, guys. Um, we It is a Friday, which means we got jaw jacking. Uh, for, I'm going to do an extended jaw jacking today. We got right up until 930. James, is this James McQuiggan? James McQuiggan with the gifted subs. First of all. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Yes, yes. Thank you, James McQuiggan. Hey, Darius Cater, Regina Franklin, Matt McDaniel, Justin M. If you're one of the recipients, Kenneth Ruff, Ian, Angela Wolverton, Sir Octavus of Williamsburg. If you're one of the recipients, first of all, thank you, James McQuiggan, for hooking these uh, community members up with squad memberships. Uh, newly minted squad members don't sleep on the emo tray. We get the Oprahs in here. The Oprah one, it's like fraying on the edges. It gets uh, used so much. But if, hey, if today is your first episode, like at peace, welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. At peace, let's give you some uh, John McClain, welcome to the party, pal, action right there. George Strasberger, so good, so good. Sweet Caroline, da, da, da. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thanks so much for the squad membership, I mean, for the super chat. All right, guys, do me a favor. Sit back, relax, and let the cool sounds of the hot news Wash over you in an awesome wave. I will see you all at the mid-roll. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Friday, November 3rd. I'm Steve Prentice. Power outage darkens Cloudflare dashboard and APIs. As of this recording, Cloudflare continues to struggle with an outage that has affected its customers' ability to use alerts Dashboard functionality, zero trust, warp, cloud flared, waiting room, gateway, stream, magic wand, AP shield, pages, and workers. Instead, they are seeing code 10,000 authentication errors and internal server errors. Cloudflare confirms the outage does not affect the cached file delivery via the Cloudflare CDN or Cloudflare Edge security features. According to numerous media sources, the company revealed that the ongoing issues are due to power outages at multiple data centers. Yeah. All right. So really quickly, because uh, I didn't want to interrupt the story. Uh, Matt R. with the 20 gifted subs. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you, Matt R. Look at this. Oh, oh, look at me from the 90s doing the cabbage patch. Uh, <laughs> I almost injured myself on that. So don't don't uh, think that's happening. Hey, Matt R. Thanks so much for the gifted sub. 
Um, if you're one of the 20 lucky recipients of those gifted subs, thank Matt R. And again, don't sleep on the emo tray. Uh, we are straight cracking it today. Uh, love it, love it, love it. Okay, so check it out. Here's the deal. Occasionally, uh, big systems can go down. And, uh, you know, it, like normally we're talking about like hackers, ransomware, whatever. And Flaming Donkey brings down, you know, uh, some power company in Germany, right? Well, occasionally, and this is, you know, this is a thing that IT needs to account for. Occasionally, um, environmental issues can happen or um, what's the word? Like, well, natural disasters for sure. Here, let me, let me break it down for you. This is definitely... Uh, the more you know uh, opportunity because we don't get these very often, all right? So I saw Jamie Fleck dropping a more you know emote squad members. Let's get this. Let's get this. The more you know train going. And if you're a longtime practitioner, you're gonna be like preach. Okay, so check it out. Cloudflare basically a lot of their services are down right now because of power outages. Now you are if you're Cloudflare or any kind of like major company that makes like what's Cloudflare's annual revenue? Let's let's check that out. Cloudflare annual revenue because at the end of the day y'all straight cash homie straight cash okay so uh for the last 12 months ending june 30th they made 1.1 billion dollars okay 1.1 billion dollars they're a billion dollar company so typically if you're going to be a billion dollar company you have your data centers but then on the roof you have uh or just outside typically on the roof well it depends on where you are if you're at risk of flooding or, or hurricanes and stuff but you'll have um Oh my God, what do they call generators? But like not the Generax that you have outside your house or like the little gas powered ones to like power like one light in your house during a hurricane. They have these massive diesel powered generators and they kick on. And basically what they do is provide power when power outages happen. That's pretty standard physical security control. Well, Cloudflare's obviously having some issues, multiple data centers down. They're probably taxing the crap out of their generators. Um, here's the more you know situation, okay? When we talk about building a cybersecurity program, there are physical security controls. Um, oh my God, what what is the, um, so PS in the NIST family is personnel security, not physical. Um, what is the physical security controls in NIST? Oh my God, Jerry, it's been a minute, huh? Holy crap. I mean, let me look at that, physical security. Uh, oh yeah, physical and environmental, PE, of course. Okay, so check it out. In NIST, we have the PE controls. When we think as practitioners, right? So a uh, person who's uh, looking to break into the industry, when we think as practitioners, like 85%, 90% of what we're thinking, the controls we're putting in place, the detection tuning we're doing, the multi-factor, the keeping our eyes on the indicators of compromise, the threat intel, the dark web, all that jazz, that is exclusively focused on threat actor behavior, threat actor activity, cyber criminals, APTs, script kitties, punks, whatever, okay? Revenge schemes, whatever. Disgruntled employees, okay? But you cannot sleep on the 15% that is not threat actors. And this is environmental and natural disaster. And oftentimes what, what'll happen is we'll put controls in place and they're like the Ronco um, you know, oven of controls. You set it and you forget it. Now, when you're doing audits, if you're an auditor, you are going to check these controls, but basically you're going to walk into the data center. You're going to look at the Halcyon um, fire extinguisher system. You're going to look at the red button. You're going to look at uh, if they have the ability to turn the water off. You're going to look where the air conditioner is, and then you're going to move on. Okay. Here's the thing. Even though you set it and forget, oh my God. Even though you set it and forget it, those physical security controls are vitally important. And it's like insurance, guys. Like you probably have, some of you probably have a fire extinguisher in your kitchen, right? You probably have never used it and hopefully you never do, but there's a fire extinguisher in the kitchen. Why? Because in the rare chance you have some hot mess express going down on your oven or your range, you need to be able to respond instantly, okay? So that's why we have these things, but we don't think about it. So Cloudflare, power outages. Uh, I'm not going to you know, cast stones. I'm not going to be the one who's like, the emperor has no clothes. But this sounds like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if they didn't do due diligence around physical environmental controls around power outages, but this is not a cyber attack. This is absolutely, um, you know, 
a, a, a basically a physical control breakdown of clean power coming into the environment. Now you would hope that um, they would have some ability to clean the power, get additional power, whatever. Uh, but this is obviously impacting um, consumers. And fun fact with the um, with a cloud based solution, it's very easy for consumers to go to another. Uh, solution, right? Like, you know, they don't have it in their data center racked and stacked. Now, I'm being a little um, hyperbolic and kind of generalized here because if you're like fully integrated with Cloudflare and you've got scripts and APIs and integrations and, you know, all that other stuff, it's not as easy as ripping it out and replacing it. But all I want to like the key takeaway for people here is that don't sleep on physical and environmental controls because when they go down, they go down hard. Apache Active MQ flaw sees Hello Kitty attempt. Following up on a story we brought you yesterday, researchers at Rapid7 are warning of a possible exploit of the vulnerability in Apache Active MQ tagged as CVE 2023-46604. Attempts to deploy the Hello Kitty ransomware were noticed in two separate customer environments. Although Apache dealt with the flaw through the October 25th release of new Active MQ versions, the researchers stated that proof of concept exploit code and vulnerability details were still publicly available. Both of the customer environments identified were running outdated versions. Yeah. All right, we covered this story um, pretty lengthy yesterday. This is the one that I want to say this is the one that had like a 9.4 uh, vulnerability score, but uh, there was suspicion that it would be actively ex exploited. I spent some time talking about Shodan Monitor, which, by the way, someone in Team Replay was like, yeah, Shodan Monitor. If you know, you know. Here's the deal. Uh, um, BSEC did a quick scan as a mod on the side. I brought it up. 65,000 of these units are on the internet facing right now. We don't know how many of them are vulnerable, but if you, here's the deal. Like, I hate to be like Maslow's uh, pyramid of priorities or whatever. And like, we, we would love to help everybody, but <laughs> first we got to take care of ourselves. So if you are running an, uh, an exploitable version of this Apache Active MQ, you've absolutely got to get it fixed right now. Yeah, hold on. Ah, you got to patch it. Ah, you got to patch it. And on top of that, uh, you need to check for indicators of compromise uh, also, okay? Now, if Hello Kitty ransomware is in your environment, they you can't be like, you can't be naive, okay? And say, oh, well, we haven't got hit with ransomware yet, so this probably wasn't compromised. Threat actors can get into your environment and not immediately detonate ransomware, okay? Sometimes they want to move laterally. Sometimes they want to find those juicy jewels. Sometimes they want to understand what your business is and how much revenue you make so they can make the ransom uh, offer something that you're willing to pay but maximizes their profits, right? They're, they're a business, guys. So again, ActiveMQ, if you're running it, get it patched. If you're running it, at this point, you need to check for indicators of compromise because this sucker's being actively exploited. Third, if you don't know if you're running it, right? You ask IT and IT's like, uh, uh, no. Right. And you're like, oh, my God, bro. Right. So you can use something like Shodan Monitor or an external vulnerability scanner to scan your external IP range. You will need your external IP address range. OK, so that is a requirement input uh, of, of value that you need. You can't scan your external IP range if you don't know what it is, obviously. Uh, and make sure it's exhaustive. Right. <clears throat> if you ask Kevin from IT, like, yo, what's the external IP range? And they're like, it's this. Uh, like it's, you know, whatever, like what, I know this isn't it, but like 1.1.1.0 slash eight, right. Uh, or one dot, that doesn't make sense, Jerry. 1.1.00 slash 16. Um, then you can be like, all right, I'm going to scan all, you know, uh, the last two octets of this thing. If they just say it's 1.1.1.4, but you're only scanning that, but there's other IPs that are external facing that you don't know about. That's a problem. So make sure that you get the exhaustive external IP address range uh, for those. Okay. All right. Let's go. Boeing says cyber incident affects parts and distribution. Following up on a story we brought you on Monday, Boeing has confirmed that a cyber attack affected its parts and distribution process, but emphasized that this does not affect flight safety. Lockbit had added Boeing to its leak site on October 27th, giving the company until November 2nd to respond. 
The company's name was removed from the leak site on Monday. No payment negotiations can be confirmed, but a Boeing spokesperson told Recorded Future News, quote, we are assessing this claim, end quote. Hawk? Yeah, no, sh- uh, <laughs> no kidding you're assessing this. <laughs> Dude, Boeing is a multi-billion dollar company. I will say that there is a Boeing, um, <coughs> excuse me, there is a Boeing, like, uh, final assembly facility in the low country. That's where they assemble the 787s. It's cool. They have like a really beautiful parking lot of 787s uh, when you go to the airport. Uh, and those coming into B-side Charleston flying in, you will absolutely see it. You can, it's unmistakable. It's freaking gigantic. So Boeing is a legit org that really does, um, I would say, do things properly. I, I believe that they implement enterprise architecture. All right. Hey, really quick. Uh, I guess mods, if you can confirm what Ken Pryor is saying, if the if the audio for the uh, for the podcast is low, if people are having a tough time here. Here, let me do this really quickly. Start a poll is is the volume of the podcast too low? I can bump it a little bit, but not much. OK, so Boeing says they're investigating right now. Boeing is a massive company. Uh, international all over the place. So it is like, you got to remember guys, like when, when a company gets popped, it's not like the entire company is screwed. This isn't 1994 where you have like one data center, everything's in it. And you got like one IT guy who's kind of managing the whole thing, right? This is 2023. A company like Boeing probably has, you know, 700 different uh, SaaS applications integrated into their environment. They're probably hosting lots of stuff in Microsoft Azure or AWS, um, compartmentalizing business units and stuff like that. So when you say Boeing, that's a bit of a you know generalization of what the impacted systems are. Now they're talking about parts and distribution business. So this would be, you know, they've already built the planes, which by the way, just from a manufacturing perspective, Straight cash, homie. That's where they make their straight cash, homie, right? Is building planes and selling them. This is around, I think, uh, providing parts to, um, you know, mechanics and, and, and outfits that are, you know, supporting and facilitating uh, management and maintenance of those systems. Um, yeah, and absolutely. I agree with BSEC here. Business, uh, well, he didn't say, B, I don't know what BPC is, but th- they definitely have a business continuity plan. There's no way... In my opinion, okay, Boeing is a class act, five-star organization, okay? They they might be boring, okay? But they're boring because they do things methodically, smart, you know, like deliberately. All the interactions I've had with Boeing and Boeing people has been uh, impressive, okay? Like I would work for Boeing, okay? I mean, if that means anything. Um, but anyways, Boeing's getting hit. I'm sure their stock did not take a, um, I'm sure their stock did not take a hit. Yeah. Look at this dude. Can you see this on stream? They got hit, they got hit somewhere in here and like, they're, you know, like, let's just say that they got hit here in October 11th, where this dip is, they were trading at 196 today. They're trading at 192. It's a speed bump, dude. Boeing's got this just chill. Okay. Uh, informs 5,000 staff of data theft due to third-party breach. This number involves current and former employees of the ID management company, and the third-party vendor was Rightway Healthcare, a company that compares healthcare providers and their rates. According to the notification to the employees, the break-in happened at Rightway's IT environment on September 23rd. Rightway informed Okta about the intrusion on October the 12th, nearly three weeks later. The information stolen includes names, social security numbers, and health or medical insurance plan numbers. All right. So Emmanuel Dark saying that Boeing is a defense contractor, so the feds take note. Absolutely true. Thanks for the super chat, Emmanuel. Did we just become best friends? Yep. I uh, definitely appreciate that perspective. Yeah. Um, but Bo- here's the deal. Boeing is so filthy rich. Great cash, homie. That they're one of those, like, you know, they're one of those defense contractors that has gravity, like uh, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, um, Halliburton, you know what I mean? So, like, they definitely, those relationships are going to be fine. Obviously, they're going to want to know uh, what's up. All right, so check it out. Okta, Okta's having a bad a bad run here. Um, 
So the, hold on. So what is this? Five thousand. It's uh, sorry. I was I was doing mod chat and and talk and thinking about my thoughts around a manual. Um. So Okta sent out breach notification to five thousand current and former employees. No surprise. They keep data on. Uh. If, once you work somewhere, they they don't like delete your file. Believe that. Um. Ooh, the word miscreants has worked in here. I always do appreciate a good miscreant word use. Um. Looks like a third party rightway healthcare. Uh. Do, do, do. Okay, so here's the deal. <clears throat> even though, <clears throat> even though Okta is in the story, Okta's in the story, and this has nothing to do with their compromised uh, the ability that you could use session tokens for Facebook to log into, you know, a, a, a different system. Um, what I would say here is that basically, guys, in 2023. Lots of businesses, like I had some metric for my my uh, Raymond James talk the other day. Businesses on average use, I, I want to say like 150 SaaS applications on average, which sounds outrageous, but dude, it, it's 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 on average, okay? Um, so good size businesses use 150. And when I say good size, like small to medium, like large enterprise, like a Boeing, we're, we're talking much closer, like 700. So when you leverage the cloud, right? Oh, the cloud, it's going to save us. We can scale up, scale down, save money, ah, right? The problem is you are transferring risk of protecting the data assets and the information of whatever you're sticking in there. So in this instance, a perfect example, Okta took their patient, Okta took their employee information and put it in something called Rightway Healthcare. Now, I don't know what Rightway Healthcare is, but it doesn't matter. There's some third-party business that does something, right? So, so uh, you know, like the business that I'm running, I don't know anything about finance and accounting, right? Carl does. <gasps> so I have a business that does my finance and accounting for me, and they just explain stuff to me. That is a great service, right? I've outsourced that thing. Tons of businesses outsource things because guess what? Okta is not in the business of employee healthcare benefits and crap like that. They outsource it. But again, every time you do that, you are taking on some risk of whatever the security controls of that third party. Now, what I will say is yes, um, and I know this is gonna trigger some people with PTSD, uh, looking at the thing, uh, it looks like 90% of people are fine with the volume, so thank you. Uh, what what this tells me is that when you're putting information in these third parties, you need to ask them, how are you going to protect this data, right? And this is like an age-old GRC argument where it's like, all right, fill out this questionnaire right there. It's already annoying because like no one's going to read the questionnaire afterwards, so just push that to the side. Second of all, like, how do you protect this data? And it's a conversation. You're not going to uh, test their controls. You're not going to validate their controls. Okay. Like, like, oh, hey, we have multi-factor for all employees on the inside. Oh, hey, we use AES-256 on the database. So, uh, and then we use like tokenization to be able to query the database. So no one can get in there. There's no business, unless you're like the federal government and you're working on like a multi-billion dollar contract, there's no business that is going to allow you to go test their environment, to go pen test them, to query their data, to validate what they're telling you. So then it becomes a handshake and a, I'll take your word for it, which is a problem because the person you're talking to may not know what they're talking about. They may have heard someone say, oh, this is what we do. Oh, okay. So. Now you're taking on additional risk, which sucks, and you can't really validate the controls that are supposed to protect it. And this is what happens. So what I would say, practically speaking, this is just occurring to me on the on the fly. Practically speaking, what I would say is, you know, anytime you push in data, especially sensitive data like PII, employee information, et cetera, anytime you're pushing data in there, you really should think about, okay, guys, let's assume this data gets breached. Is that are we okay? excuse me, are we okay with that? And it's not, don't ask that question confrontationally because the business obviously wants to push the data in there. So if you say it confrontationally, you're going to look like a peckerhead and they're not going to want to talk to you. So what you have to say is, hey, like I love this right way healthcare. I'm really pumped that you business people found it. 
Um, I've done like a quick analysis of the security controls. It looks okay. However, what I want to ask you before we decide to move forward is if the it, assume they get breached and that data gets breached and it go it goes public, kind of like this Okta story. Let me send you a link to it. Are we okay with that? Are we okay? Well, no, we're not okay. We can't have that happen. All right, all right, all right. That's fine. That's fine. Well, then we need to do a little bit more due diligence on what their security controls are, or we need to encrypt the data before we push it over there or whatever, whatever it is. Or we need to keep it in-house and give them um, some type of VPN connection or some type of access into our, our environment to pull the data that they need, right? Or we need to make them call the data when they're done processing it, right? Like, let's say it's a payroll company. Listen, Every time an employee leaves, guess what? They're not going to get paid anymore. So you need to archive that data off and at least reduce the risk, man, right? You're not going to get a Boolean all or nothing. So, you know, you, you might be able to just reduce the impact, which by the way, that's what GRC is. We're, we're reducing likelihood and impact up in here, brah. All right, let's go. 831, damn it. A minute, a minute off on my mid roll. And now, a word from our sponsor, Hunters. There's nothing worse than relying on a legacy SIM that your security team has outgrown, especially when it impacts your ability to detect real incidents. Hunters SOC platform offers built-in, always up-to-date detection rules and automatic correlation that allow SOC analysts to focus on higher value tasks that impact your organization. It's time to move to a platform that reduces risk, complexity, and cost for the SOC. Visit hunters.security to learn how you can replace your SIM today. All right. Welcome to the mid-roll. All right, guys. Love the mid-roll. Love the mid-roll. Uh, tried to lower the music a little bit on the uh, Simple Mind song. Let me know if uh, the audio is okay here, mods, please. All right, guys, check it out. Welcome to the mid-roll. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Ozier. And every day at 30 minutes past the hour, I say thank you. Thank you, Jana R. Thank you, Two Weights. Thank you, Lupe Peterman. Thank you, Jesse Johnson. Thank you, Kimberly McKnight. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for putting in the work. Thank you for making the Simply Cyber community something to be proud of and something that delivers value to so many people every single day. I genuinely appreciate it. If you're getting value from the stream, either educational value or entertainment value, go ahead and hit that like button, pay it forward. It helps other people find the stream. I wanna say thank you to the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber Solutions, Panopsi Security, and Anti-Siphon Training. Listen, Anti-Siphon Training is disrupting the traditional training industry by providing high quality, cutting edge education to everyone like you, Jonathan, like you, Zach Cho, like you, Stephanie Strauss, like you, Tim Ferrari, regardless of your financial position, just like Simply CyberCon. It, do not let financials gatekeep you from being able to get access to really good training and really good professionals teaching you that training. Engage with the community in a fun, inclusive way. Use the link in the description below. I don't know what's up with my mic. We'll, we'll work on it. Um, so check it out. Um, go to the link in the description below. Go to Anti-Siphon Training, bookmark it. Go to training, go to pay what you can training, and check out the calendar of events coming up. Um, so much awesome content. If you wanna do API security study for CISSP, learn to use Wireshark, get uh, breaking into in, uh, information security training, become a SOC analyst, get taught by John Strand. Whatever it is you wanna do, anti-siphon training. That's a great place to start, so giddy up on it. Holla! All right, guys, the Simply Cyber Community Challenge is ongoing. Pamela Joshua did the post today, or she has the baton, saw her post, commented on her post, worked in the medical field for 15 years, got the itch around IT and InfoSec, worked her way in there, and skilled, reskilled during the pandemic, and guess what? Boom! She broke into cybersecurity. Hard work, commitment, vigilance, and seeing it through, way to go, Pamela. Thank you so much for sharing it. Pamela's gonna tag someone in chat right now. 
Join us in the Simply Cyber Community Challenge if you want to build a meaningful professional network. Essentially, hack your LinkedIn feed, right? Go find people, like basically search for this hashtag. Pamela Joshua's post is going to come up, okay? Search for this hashtag. Connect with Pamela Joshua. Connect with the people posting using that hashtag. Comment on the posts. Connect with the people in comments. The next person who comes through, guess what? When they connect with the people in the comments, they're going to connect with you. You're going to blow up your LinkedIn network connections. Five minutes a day, two weeks time. I guarantee you, you will see the value. And once you hit the two week stride, you're not going to slow down. You're going to keep going and blowing it up. Everybody in chat has their own testimonial. So don't take my word for it. Straight up, do it yourself. Pamela Joshua, tag someone. And uh, we're going to have a good time. Guys, every single Friday is Grayson's Joke of the Week. Grayson's on sabbatical. James McQuiggan, our very own, is sitting in Grayson's chair. Here is the Jokes of the Week. Now, I want you guys to know that James McQuiggan really loves his family room furniture. He is a huge fan of his family room furniture. Him and his recliner, they go way back. <laughs> also, uh, James wants you to know that he considers himself a very trusting person, but he has to admit to everybody in the Simply Cyber community that he doesn't trust Adams. That's right. He trusts a lot of people, but not Adams because they make up everything. No, no trust there. I do love the recliner. Uh, James McQuiggan and his family room furniture, the recliner and him go way back. Love it, love it, love it. Thanks so much, James. Let's keep rolling and we'll get to jaw jacking at the end. Ransomware attack hits 70 German municipalities. The attack has paralyzed local government services in towns across the western part of the country. Its cause was an unknown hacker group that encrypted the files of a municipal service provider, Sudwestfalen IT. This outage resulted in the cancellation of online services such as finance and registry offices. According to German cybersecurity experts, quote, the timing of the attack is particularly sensitive as local governments typically perform financial transactions such as salaries, social assistance, and transfers from the nursing care fund at the end of the month. End quote. All right. I mean, this does seem like a uh, targeted attack. Um, I would argue... You know, my I guess my first thought is nation state threat actor, but as a ransom, here's the thing: nation state threat actors can use ransomware um, to kind of facilitate misattribution, um, make it look like you know whatever. This does seem like a targeted attack. Germany is a very strong financial power in the European Union, very much aligned with uh, NATO and and Western philosophies. Um, 70, 70 municipalities is pretty strong. Uh, hold on. We got some uh, jokes of the week coming in. Grayson's getting uh, m mad support. Rex Cognito dropping. What kind of network address prefers undersea travel? A subnet. One ping for subnet. <laughs> Thanks so much for the super chat and the joke, uh, Rex. Did we just become best friends? Yep. yep. Thanks so much. That's a good one. I like that. All right, so 70 municipalities is pretty hardcore. If I had to guess, okay, if I had to guess, and again, I don't research these stories. If I had to guess some upstream service or whatever got ransomware, which had downstream impact to all of these municipalities, I don't think ransomware got deployed into 70 different businesses. <clears throat> um, let's just really quickly. Um, yeah, you could see here, unknown hackers, basically encrypted the servers of uh, Sudwestfalen IT, which I think is an MSP providing IT services to over 70 municipalities, as ex as I just you know posited. Um, basically, upstream IT provider who's hosting all of this uh, IT infrastructure for municipalities got cracked. This is another thing with supply chain and, um, you know, basically, uh, um, what's the word? I'm thinking of like, um, like workflows, right? Downstream workflows. So you would hope that sued Westfallen IT has decent business continuity plan, has a disaster recovery plan. Um, as they mentioned in the story, a lot of these businesses, money transactions happen at the first of the month. I mean, clearly because this is government, um, there is going to be, um, 
there is going to be, you know, a little bit of grace accepted. I know money makes the world go round, but being down for like a week, you know, I, I'm not like some like highfalutin businessman or anything like that. But here's the deal. Like, I feel like a week of downtime of not having money flow is not going to like, no, no business is going to be like, we're cutting you off. Absolutely not. Like you pay us. This isn't the mob. Like, Oh, I'm sorry. Your rent, your your IT infrastructure got encrypted. F you. Pay me. Like, what are we doing here? So now, if they're down long term, that's a problem. But this seems. I know it, it's an unnamed threat actor group. I would be interested to see if this was a targeted APT attack. Um, you know, Germany's been you know involved in the Ukrainian Russian conflict. I'm not sure what Germany's position has been with the uh, Israeli Hamas um, situation going on over there. I haven't been really paying attention to Germany. So if someone in chat knows what's going on, that would be interesting. But um, guys, if you're an MSP and you're servicing, like say you're an MSP for like a bunch of healthcare providers, right? That's your that's your bread and butter. You should have some type of ransomware recovery process. You should be communicating with your business clients. You should be doing tabletop exercises. Do freaking tabletop exercises, please. Prolific Puma outed for link shortening cybercrime services. The security company Infoblox describes this little known threat actor, Prolific Puma, as a company that provides, quote, domain names with an RDGA, that's registered domain generation algorithm, and uses these domains to provide a link shortening service to other malicious actors, helping them evade detection while they distribute phishing, scams, and malware, end quote. Little is known about the group and its owners, but it has registered between 35,000 and 75,000 unique domain names since April 2022 and also acts as a DNS threat actor, which leverages DNS infrastructure for its criminal pursuits. A link to the Infoblox report is available in the show notes to this episode. WhatsApp mod. All right. So really quickly, I don't know if you guys went to Cyber Criminal Con 2023 in uh, Tampa, Florida. But Prolific Puma's booth was amazing. They had one of the booths up in the front. They were talking about how they can offer malicious URL shortening services. Don't let your infrastructure get taken down. Get through those uh, email security gateways with Prolific Puma. The merch at the Prolific Puma's booth was sick, right? They, they had a happy hour with bourbon. Uh, it was really, really cool. I'm being facetious. There was no cyber criminal con. It was not in Tampa or Orlando. My point is... This prolific Puma is basically a business. It's not basically, it's straight up a business for criminal threat actors. That is their client base. No legitimate business is using prolific Puma's URL shortening service as a bit.ly link. In the, like I use, I think I have a, a shortener for like the anti-siphon training link down below. And, and the reason you want to use a shortener is because one, if you got this ridiculously long URL, it, it, it makes it look cleaner. Two, with a shortener, because it redirects through the shortening service, you can uh, attribute clicks and, and metrics that way. Like if Black Hills or Anti-Siphon was like, Jerry, how many people click on your Anti-Siphon link in, in, you know, in the description? I can tell them that, right? So there are values to these services. The way that they're using it, in addition to the benefits I just told you, right? Because I'm sure they're keeping track of clicks and links and all this other crap. Uh, the reason that they're doing that is because it can help get through um, email security gateways. You can you can send it to someone in a text message and it doesn't look like maliciousinfrastructure.com. It looks like some shortener. Uh, so I'm really happy that researchers exposed it. They, they, they used the adjective prolific, which, you know, to me, I'm a big, you know, word nerd. If you've ever heard me uh, talk, I, I, I do... I do like using the right words for uh, the proper, you know, description or whatever. The the correct vernacular to explain the lexicon that I want to uh, use to convey the effective messaging. Uh, but here's the deal. I want to know, like, I'm glad this thing got taken down, but I want to know um, how researchers found it. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, that's the real question to me. It doesn't advertise its shortening service in underground markets. So threat actors are talking to each other 
in dis, you know, private discords, private DMs, bro, you got to check out prolific Puma. It's all the rage. No one knows about it, you know? And, um, if I had to guess, okay. If I, Ooh, Hey, what's up? Look at this. Hey, <laughs> you know, you guys know I've got a thing for infographics. Look at this. Okay. So bad domain one goes through a shortener, shorten URL, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So like, this is not this is not really, this is how URL shorteners work, period. It doesn't say, okay, so I don't see anything in here about how the researchers found it, but I'm going to go ahead, instead of having you guys watch me read this, I'm going to do a, throw the tinfoil hat on and do a speculative hot take. Guys, researchers, law enforcement, whoever, they have sock puppet accounts. They have dark web accounts. They're running around inside of these criminal forums pretending to be criminals and that's how they get intel right it's it's how they find out about what is out there so if i had to guess somebody in the know somebody who you know, like in the prolific puma fight club who was supposed to not talk about prolific puma fight club told some type of um sock puppet account or poser uh and the word got out so that's up that's what's up good burn it to the ground uses Telegram to hit Arabic-speaking users with spyware. A report from researchers at Kaspersky describes the proliferation of the mod as one of many that contain malware code. The mods are modified versions of apps, ideally to add features that the original developers did not include, but in this case was abused by malware propagators. This mod, named by the researchers as trojan-spy.androidos.canes-spy, that's C-A-N-E-S, uses Telegram to travel primarily to Azerbaijan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Turkey, and Egypt. The researchers pointed out, quote, WhatsApp mods are mostly distributed through third-party Android app stores, which often lack screening and fail to take down malware, end quote. Yeah, okay. Microsoft. Cool. All right, here's the deal. I mean, come on, man. All right, so, you know, and I, I don't know what, like, so I work in the United States. I've done some Europe stuff, but, uh, like, for the most part, I'm very, um, you know, ill-equipped or uneducated around not the Middle East in general, but, like, the way that typical uh, end-user behavior, the way typical non-technical people, the way typical consumers consume technology in the Middle East, okay? So definitely admitting my ignorance on that. Putting that aside, dude, what are you doing? Like, so, like, oh my God. So WhatsApp already, you know, you kind of, you know, got a hairy eyeball on that, but like, fine, let's use WhatsApp. The fact that you can like download some type of mod to your WhatsApp app through a Telegram app, like what what are you doing like do you also like find random usb drives on the ground and pick them up and jam them into your computer too just to see what happens i could understand and again i'm not please i'm not belittling people who fall victim to this okay but i can see children and young adults falling victim to these type of ruses when i was a young child i would download you know software cracks uh, i feel like the um um what, what, what's the term in law enforcement where like the statute of limitations has passed on these things. But dude, when you don't have money and you want to play like a new game or like, you know, something's like, Oh, free Fortnite skins or Roblox or whatever. You're, you're a kid. You don't know any better. You're like, yeah, sure. This is like, I'm in the know. I got the hacks. Right. And in reality, you're just compromising the crap out of yourself. So with things like this, guys, if you can, I know this isn't going to hit so well with, you know, um, United States, users and stuff like that because it's arabic speaking users so maybe you just kind of carve that part out and just say whatsapp spy mods through telegram and just use it as a case study that listen if you're getting links to things through non-formal channels right if you're being asked to download something through a text message chances are it's not a good thing you should only be downloading things from official stores basically the apple store or the google play store and even on the google play store you know, you're, you're, you're rolling the dice a little bit, right? I mean, let's say you roll two dice and, you know, 10 and below you're safe, but there's still like an 11 and 12, you can roll and get accidentally popped with some malware, but freaking downloading mods, like what kind of mod? And by the way, like my, my kid the other day showed me, he got a phone. Oh my God. That's where we're at with him. My, my kid got a phone and he like showed me like his keyboard on his phone and how it's like, it's like 
it's like different. It's like a different keyboard with like fancy fonts. And I'm like, where'd you get that? And he's like, well, I downloaded it. I'm like, oh my God. But we have controls in place around that. But my point is I get why mods, mods, meaning modifiers to an application, not mods like Jenny Housley, BSEC, Jesse Johnson, Kimberly, moderator uh, modifiers to an application can enhance features and, and extend capabilities, right? Google extensions and Google Chrome is a lot of fun. TLDR, do not download mod app to apps through Telegram or any other thing. Signal, Telegram, WhatsApp mod coming through WhatsApp. Use official channels only. Please tell your, at Thanksgiving, right? If you're celebrating Thanksgiving, when you're sitting around the table and people are saying what they're thankful for, I'm so thankful for having you in my life. I'm so thankful for uh, you know, having, having heat and, and electricity. I'm so thankful for the sun rising in the morning. You can be like, I'm so thankful that everybody in this table downloads their mobile apps through official, <laughs> official store channels. And then, you know, like, and then you can like rip the turkey leg off and be like, listen, I get the turkey leg. Cause I had the best thing to be thankful for. You feel me? All right, let's keep rolling. Reveals secure future initiative to bolster security. This plan announced yesterday, Thursday, pledges to, quote, improve the built-in security of its products and platforms to better protect customers against escalating cybersecurity threats, end quote. It is going to be called the Secure Future Initiative, SFI, and will have three pillars, quote, focused on AI-based cyber defenses, advances in fundamental software engineering, and advocacy for stronger application of international norms to protect civilians from cyber threats, end quote. This will include automation and artificial intelligence to transform software development, aiming to deliver what it describes as, quote, software that is secure by design, by default, and in deployment, end quote, while also prioritizing secure defaults to ensure optimal protections for users out of the box. All right, a couple things here. One, priceless pancake. Uh, taking, taking my words to heart, always use Pirate Bay. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you so much for the super chat, Priceless Pancake. Uh, I agree with BSEC. This is really cool. Okay, so guys, I've been saying this kind of ad nauseum for a while. Like I, 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 I heart Microsoft. Microsoft used to be a joke when it came to security. They have gotten wicked serious. It's probably because uh, Great cash, homie. <laughs> there's big money in, fi in federal contracts and Microsoft's all up in that business. If you look at like what Mike, where Microsoft makes their revenue, uh, Microsoft Azure Office 365 is right up there. Don't sleep on LinkedIn and Xbox, but let's be real. Um, they are making a pledge to, to um, the Secure Future Initiative. I love this. And I don't think that this is a bunch of um, smoke in order to like look good and get PR. Um, they talked about using AI for um, AI-based defenses so they can move faster right? They're like the million dollar man, $8 million man, whatever. That was before my time. But basically they're, they're using the tools that are available to them in order to make defenders faster, stronger, better. Here is the deal. They're doing something that I love. Okay. Here's what Microsoft is doing. This is what I got out of the story. Again, I don't prep for these stories. Two things is happening here that I that I caught that I think is good. One, using AI-based tools to facilitate the support of um, defense, right? So enabling um, defenders to move quicker, have basic tier zero triage happening automatically, having, you know, like phishing emails get blocked automatically, timely, um, flexible policies. Okay. I love that. Second of all, and probably most importantly, having default configurations be secured instead of wide open. So you're going to you're going to require businesses and, and engineers to basically have to configure basically reduce security on IT in order to make it work for the business. Now that might sound ridiculous. You're like, what are you talking about? But imagine this if you will. The current model is it's insecure by default. Everything's open, right? Nothing is secure. Not I'm excuse me, nothing is configured. So then when you put it in place, and again, no disrespect to my IT counterparts, but when you put it in place and then you turn it on and the packets are flowing and the business is like, yeah, you're like, I'm done here, baby. Look at me. Give like, can, hey, mods, can I see the um, mods? Can you pull up the Michael Scott 
with, with the fanny pack, getting an award um, a meme, please. So what I'm saying here is that's the normal model, but it leads to countless data breaches, leaky S3 buckets, misconfigured uh, exposure. Your attack surface is huge. Over permissioning, right? Oh, hey, give this guy's here. Give him the same access as Jerry. Well, Jerry's been here like 30 years. Uh, and Jerry has like way more access than he needs. So maybe we don't need to do that. Secure by default means when they put it in place, it's not going to work, but the business is going to be like, Jerry, why isn't it working? You're like, let me work on it, boss. And like, you basically start tinkering and tuning and opening things up. And now the business will get it to work and it will have less attack surface, less exposure, more secure, and they're hooking it up on purpose. Here we go. This is what I'm talking about. If you've seen this meme before, if you've seen this meme before, oh, hold on. Well, you guys get it. Basically, in this instant, hold on. In this instant, uh, Michael Scott's getting awarded for something he didn't do. This is basically what I, when I see this right here, what I'm seeing is uh, management thanking you for your IT deployment. And all you did was roll out the default config. Like you just hit deploy. You hit the red button that says deploy. And then they're like, Wow, you're amazing. I don't know what kind of magic you're crafting back in the data center, but thumbs up, everything's good. And you're like, I did nothing, question mark. So this is what's up. And, you know, basically the, the only thing, by the way, can I just share with you? And this is, uh, we don't have a Ric Flair emoji, but we can get one. By the way, I think with the recent addition of squad members, I, we're about to hit a thousand squad members, guys. I, I can pull up the metrics during jaw jacking. But hit, the final thing I want to remind you, and this is a more you know kind of thing. Let me, where's my more you know? This is a more you know kind of thing. Okay. You've got to be careful. I've seen this happen too. All right. So let's pretend for a second that Microsoft's Secure Future Initiative goes, goes YOLO, goes completely ham on secure configurations. So, um, Luke, you know, Luke Canfield and Jeffrey are IT engineers, and they're going to roll out some new Microsoft product. The business is like, here's a bunch of money. Here's a bunch of time. Roll it out. And you roll it out, and nothing works because it's already wicked hardened, and you have to release things, right? Now, Luke Canfield and Jeffrey are pros, so they're going to start... Um, Well, first of all, they're going to figure out what the business actually needs to do, and then configure the technology to enable whatever that is to happen. Now, Let's say Carl, like, let's say Luke Canfield and Jeffrey are out that day, but the business is like, we're doing this right now. And they're like, Carl, you available? Carl. So Carl comes running in and says, I'm ready. What are we doing? They're like, listen, we need to communicate to this thing and we need a database or whatever. Carl deploys the Microsoft technology that's wicked secure. And Carl's like, we're good here. And the business is like, no, we're not good here. Nothing is working. We can't access it. Packets aren't flowing. By the way, the business is never going to say packets aren't flowing. Um, cause they don't know what that means, but, but it doesn't work. There is a risk here where Carl, Carl right clicks properties, opens everything like open to everyone, which is the classic, you know, uh, permission issue in, in windows environments. But like, basically there is a consideration here that someone who doesn't know what they're doing doesn't properly configure it. They basically just roll it back to a completely insecure configuration. And then we're back at the same problem here where, where essentially um, you are insecure, um, but there's a human intervention. So just be, just be mindful of that. Okay, let's go. Remember to join us later today for- Oh yeah, boy. All right, guys. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, Carl. 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 Just become best friends. Yep. Carl with the uh, super chat. Yo, check this out. Before you go, what do we got? 287 of you guys today. Why? What? 287? Bro, normally we're like in the 350s. I don't know what happened. Friday, college students. We got 70 college students who are uh, <laughs> having a tough morning. All right, guys. Right at uh, the top of the hour. It's 9 o'clock. Before we go, uh, we are going to do jaw jacking, but I want to share a couple important things with you. One, Eric Capuano, the guy who developed that So You Want to Be a Sock Analyst blog post, has released an updated 2.0 version of the blog post. 
if you were having trouble getting the VMs working, if you were on an, a Mac M1 or M2 or M3 silicon chipset, if you were having technical issues and it prevented you from doing the labs, my man Eric Capuano is dropping bombs up in here. He's released an updated version. He's hosting the infrastructure in Azure. So you can just get right down to business and do the technical stuff. I will be doing a video follow uh, follow along walkthrough for this in December at some point. But I just wanted to make you aware of this. This thing just dropped uh, today. Now, this is part of his paid platform. Um, and I'm sure it's very, very affordable. Uh, but hey, hosting infrastructure doesn't cost zero dollars. If you're interested, check out this blog post. I love Eric Capuano. I think the guy is a freaking treasure to our information security community and definitely pumped. Also, guys, get ready. Get ready. We've got a major update. Next week is Simply CyberCon. Believe that. I put together this crude graphic because I'm terrible at graphics. But look at this. This is the calendar of events. Monday, we got an OSINT workshop with Charles Finfrock. Tuesday, LinkedIn profile workshop from Mike Miller. Wednesday, Simply CyberCon. Thursday, um, Jessica Hyde is coming on Simply Cyber Live at 4.30 to answer your question about breaking into DFIR. And then rounding out the week, Jack Scott with the iHeart NIST cybersecurity framework workshop. Dude, we have got content blowing out our ears next week. So don't sleep on this. Go to simplycybercon.org. I am super, super pumped about that. All right, y'all. If you were here just for the news, I thank you very much. Have a great, great weekend. I will see you at B-Sides Charleston, where I'll be keynoting what Game of Thrones can teach us about cybersecurity. If you're there, please say hi. I'm super pumped. I'll see you out there, Frank. I'll see you there, Casually Joseph. I'll see you there, Matt Jones. I'll see you there, Steve Cardinal. <gasps> I'll see you there, Aaron Heath. I'll see you there, everyone. Uh, be well, and until the next time, stay secure. Now, if you're here for some jaw jacking, I am repping the midnight on my shirt. Let's do it. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the party. How we doing? Now, this is the jaw jacking. If you're not familiar with that, jaw jacking is where we just hang out, do a little AMA. We kick it, especially because it's Friday. Uh, and I can go till 930. And then I have a meeting with the very talented um, UK citizen, Gary Ruddle. Uh, we meet uh, every couple weeks and just kind of jaw jack with each other. So that's all about good times. Lighting in here is pretty good. The studio has been good. If you got any questions, drop them in chat. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, and if you want to just hang out, uh, you're more than welcome to do that too. Let me do this. Uh, Harris Heller stream beats. Let's do this. Um, let me do a full album. Let's do a new one. All right, y'all. Where are you at? What's up? Super pumped. Hey, Jason Bagwell. I love some jaw jacking too. Hope everybody's doing well. Carl, as a Carl, I need access to the Carl email. Can I buy a membership? And if so, how? Thanks. So Carl, if you want to be a squad member on YouTube, there should be like a join button. I'm, I'm a... I'm a squad member as well. I pay for squad membership to my own um, membership. So I can't show you the join button, but like, I think it's right under the subscribe button on YouTube. Um, if you're on mobile, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but basically you hit join. And then I like, there's two memberships. There's a $2 membership and there's a $5 membership. You get access to the same stuff. It's more of just like a Patreon thing. Uh, if you want to support the channel and then the emotes are just for fun. Oh, very nice. Tim McDonald. Enjoy that GRC course. Um, I, I love the GRC course. Nice, nice. Let's see. Bopper, no stopper. Talking to Micah. DP, what's up, DP? Hopefully DP and KP are straight kicking it. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you so much, DP. Got to meet DP at Wild West Hack and Fest and also got to meet KP at Wild West Hack and Fest. Uh, love what they're doing. Long time support has been around since before, um, since before, uh, we did, um, counting numbers and all the clean, you know, uh, layouts and stuff like that. 
Um, Jessica Propes, yeah, Cyber Kill Jane, uh, Mrs. Osier built those built-ins. These things are sick, guys. She also, like, I want to point out, do you notice that the um, the space for this huge TV is perfectly placed? My wife, not only, hey, KP, whoa! Wow. KP's in the house. Good to see you, KP. Uh, super pumped. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Osier is, um, you think, so like i'm like really type a control freak type stuff mrs osier is like really into like precision and doing things well like really well um so the fact that this is looks perfect is not a coincidence all right i saw a question come in here where, where are we at lazaro saying oh gary sturgiotis yes yeah, somebody's got a birthday coming up next week for sure uh, Dr. Rozier, I have a few individuals reach out for mentorship on LinkedIn, but as a grasshopper in cyber still, what would be a good way to approach this? Thanks for all you do. So Lazaro, the first thing I would say is where, like, you know, I understand you're, you're self-identifying as grasshopper. A couple things, guys. Um, first of all, there's imposter syndrome. Push that aside. Second of all, I want you to know, like, no matter where you are on your cybersecurity journey, like, let's say you haven't even broken in yet, but you have your SEC Plus, there is a group of people who want to be where you are. There's a group of people, like, wherever you started, you've made progress, you've grown, you've done things, right? So you have value to deliver regardless of where you are on your cybersecurity journey. So, so Lazaro, what I would say if it were me, and I and I do this in my own like simply cyber mentoring at scale, here's what I do. Like be honest, be real. Like, dude, I am not um if you gave me like an Android APK malware, like I could probably bumble my way through it and do malware analysis on it, but that's not my expertise. So I wouldn't I wouldn't like I wouldn't pose that like I could help someone with that. But what I would say, Lazaro, is um, for those who are reaching out to you for mentorship, share resources that you have access to share your th honest thoughts, share your own experiences, right? That's the best, um, advice I can give. Introduce them to the simply cyber community, not to pump my own numbers, but like there's great people in here helping each other, right? We got a super chat coming in. Where, where is it? Did I miss it? Holy crap. Super chats for days. Uh, Rex Cognito, if you're familiar with them, what are your thoughts on boot camps like Thrive DX, now Hacker DU through various universities? All right, so thanks for the super chat, Rex. Did we just become best friends. Yep. Um, okay, so I have heard of Thrive DX. I do not know one way or the other whether it's good. What I will tell you is uh, two things. One, one is. Um, I, I would say like 90% of boot camps, right? And this is anecdotal evidence. I haven't done research on it, but like 90% of boot camps are hot trash. Okay. They're like, dude, I had someone come by the other day and they're like, Hey, my kid's 22 and he wants to get into cybersecurity. Like he, re someone reached out to him and said like, um, they could help him, but it's going to be like, they need, he needs to put $500 down and 500 bucks a month and they'll 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 take them through like a program and I'm like what like what are you talking about so a lot of boot camps are straight you know straight cash homie right they, you you like but there are 10% that are good thrive dx i've heard of thrive dx i have not heard of bad things about thrive dx but i cannot support nor um uh like diss thrive dx what i would say is whether it's thrive dx or any kind of like boot camp or anything like that, what I would say is do the following. One, review the curriculum, right? Does it make sense for what they're doing? And by the way, drill into the curriculum. Somebody sent me one the other day and they're like, um, it was like eight classes. He's like, oh, I can get any one of these paid for by the skill bridge through uh, the US military. Um, which one should I take? And I, well, I was like, first of all, like, what do you want to do? But second of all, like they were just like titles, like, oh, like infrastructure specialist. I'm like, you need to look at the curriculum. What learning objectives are you going to go get? Because here's the deal. I don't care what the name of the course, the course could be called Flim Flam Jim Jam. It doesn't matter. Are you going to learn how to set up a SIM? Are you going to learn how to look at logs? Are you going to learn how to, you know, do the cyber kill chain? Like what skills are going to be conveyed to you and how are they going to test? Because 
really employers don't care if you went to Thrive DX or you went to Rapid Ascent or whatever. What they care about is what knowledge did you obtain and how can you apply it to help them solve their cybersecurity challenges? So look at their curriculum. Second of all, and most importantly, and this one's a tricky one, find at least, and guys, this is going to take energy and effort, find three people that have completed the program and ask them, what is their experience like? Did they get a job? Did they find it added value? Were they happy? Do not ask the boot camp for these referrals because they will cherry pick ones that are, you know, tailored testimonials. You got to find people who have done it. And that's why you want to build a LinkedIn network. That's awesome. That's why you want to connect with the Simply Cyber community, right? Um, Look at Marcus Kyler in chat. I did Thrive DX through University of Michigan, got a lot out of it. Might be beyond a lot of people's price point, and I get it. So here we go. Marcus Kyler, a trusted member of the Simply Cyber community, providing an unfettered, unbiased opinion on Thrive DX. And that's what I'm saying. Get three of them. So it sounds like it's good. It's a little pricey. There you go. That's how I would approach that. Okay. Uh, and thanks for the super chat. We got another super chat coming in. Oh gosh. The, 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 uh, Taylor McDonald passed pen test plus yesterday, finished my bachelor's degree in cybersecurity. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Yep. Congratulations. Congratulations on pen test plus passing. Congratulations on bachelor's degree. And because you just double dipped. Solid Taylor McDonald straight crushing it, homie. Thanks for the super chat, obviously, but Congratulations on you continuing to put in the work, put in the effort. Super pumped for you. Very, very happy. Okay, mods are coming at me strong. Um, Jonathan says, uh, I'd love to get into cyber eventually, but in development right now, I assume you mean software development. What are some things I can do as a software developer to make my security team's lives easier? Ooh, great question. Great question, Jonathan. I got something for you, brah. Check this out. Here we go. We're going to the split screen. Okay, hold on. Again, like what what a what a what a filthy dirty interface this is, but just bear with me, okay? Check this out. Um six things info uh, DevOps. Check this out. This is absolutely value add. Okay? So this is Naomi Buckwalter right here. Hold on. There whoop. This is Naomi. Naomi's great, okay? Naomi gave, uh, now this is from Absolute AppSec, so I can't, I can't speak to this actual recording. However, Naomi uh, gave this talk at Wild West Hack Invest. I was sitting in the front row. I attended this whole talk. Okay, Wh where's chat? Hold on, where's chat? Chat? Did I cover chat? Oh, there's chat. Uh, who asked that question? Jonathan? Yeah, Jonathan. Here's what I would do. I just dropped the link in chat to you, bud. Here's what I would do. Go watch this thing. This talk is called Six Things DevOps Wants from InfoSec. Now, it's a reverse of what you're asking because she's positioning herself as what the DevOps people actually want. But I, I, I believe me, Jonathan, if you watch this video, you can invert the lessons that she's teaching and use it to deliver value to your security team by the way, that'll also help you bridge into cybersecurity because you will become an advocate of the cybersecurity office. You'll start building relationships. You'll start networking, which is massive value. And uh, you're going to get into that. So shout out to Naomi Buckwalter for this particular talk that she gave. Um, and I'm, you know, there's value here in it. So uh, definitely get on that, Jonathan. Uh, that would be my advice. Oh, really quickly. I don't know if uh, they're still here. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Brittany Burnham. Is Brittany Burnham still in chat? Uh, she may have left because I... Oh, no. Brittany Burnham is here. Thanks. So Brittany Burnham, shout out to Brittany. Picking up the baton. Looking forward to your post for the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Thanks, Brittany. Um, so BSEC is also saying, Jonathan, check out Secure Coding. You definitely want to get into secure coding. Also, I would encourage looking at secure CI CD uh, deployments as well. Uh, Cyber Andy says, I'll be graduating with a bachelor's in cyber next month, and I wish I did computer science. Oh, well, yes, Cyber Andy, 
um, not, not to kick you while you're down, but yeah. Um, computer science, a little bit more involved. Um, but th- Hey, cyber Andy, don't, don't sleep. What, what I would encourage you to do cyber Andy is don't, uh, don't be dismayed, uh, by, you know, your degree, like your degree is a great accomplishment. Congratulations. What I would say is do the following, um, like independently learn about operating systems, independently learn about networking. Those two things are vitally important. And then three, um, do some like, um, get some, get some like training experience around system administration. And that will, that will, um, complement what you're doing, uh, and what you missed out on computer science. Cause really computer science degrees, which, uh, <laughs> not to be a nerd, uh, but I can speak, I have a bachelor's and a master's in computer science. So like, this is, this is an informed opinion. Okay. A computer science degree basically does two things. One, it teaches you programming and two, it teaches you the main core tech stack of, uh, a, a, a business system, right? So databases, networking, operating systems, applications, right? This is like what a fundamental uh, computer science degree is. So if you take your cybersecurity degree and just augment those key pieces, and I wouldn't even really focus on databases, frankly, networking, operating system, if you want databases, and then programming, um, you will basically address the gap that you didn't get with that computer science degree. Okay. Uh, Be well, BSEC, be well. All right, guys, continuing to look here. Mia W saying, have you heard of anything bad about the University of Texas Austin Cyber's 24-month program? Mia, I have not heard anything one way or the other about uh, University of Texas Austin cybersecurity program. Uh, does anyone in chat um, does anyone in chat know anything about it? Would love that. Um, let me see. Uh, do... I will tell you, 24 months is reasonable. Like a lot of people want like 90 day boot camps, and that's ridiculous. All right, um, let's get into it, shall we? So I like edX as well. Um, I'm looking at their program right now. It says 24 weeks, not 24 months. So that's that's the first thing that is interesting. It is half a year, but it's not 24 months. Uh, security fundamentals. All right. Sys admin. Okay. There we go. So this is, I mean, this is literally what I just told Cyber Andy, right? Operating systems, right? A little bit of programming, active directory, because you're going to deal with that in real environments. Um, networking, wicked valuable. Okay. Network architecture, definitely good. Defensive security. Sims, forensic, Splunk. Okay, offensive. All right. Hey, just on the surface, I don't know what this costs, but just on the surface, this looks pretty good, Mia. This looks pretty good. What I would say, Mia, is please, I know it's hard and I know it's work, but what I would recommend you do is what I just said. This looks good on the surface, okay? However, it could have crappy instructors. It could be like a a diploma mill, right? It it probably isn't. It probably isn't. But you need to do the due diligence to validate that, right? I would find three people that went through this program and get their opinions on it, okay? It says get access to a global network of employers looking to hire. Okay. I would have a call with the, um, the program coordinators for this thing and say, listen, when you say that, like how many, like, what is the percentage of graduates getting jobs at getting jobs a and then b how long after graduation did they get the job okay that's what i would ask and and final final value add when you're going through something like this you absolutely need to take advantage um and and be committed and work hard on it okay i want to i want to give you guys one quick example okay like this is whoop jessica probes coming in hot Hey, Simply Cyber fam. Welcome, Bruce Probst. Mr. Cyber Kill Jane. Hello, Bruce. Good to see you. Working to break into cyber. He's usually a passive observer. No problem. We love passive observers too. But since he commented on the built-ins, I'm going to call him out. All right. What's up? Thanks for the super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. And uh, Mr. Uh, cyber Kill Jane, <laughs> want to say shout out. Um, as you probably know, Jessica has been a longtime member of the Simply Cyber community. 
and love uh, love Cyber Kill Jane and all that she's done for the community. Uh, hey, so here's what I would uh, here's what I would tell you, okay? And I'm just one guy, but I feel like this is a truth in general, okay? So, um, I, okay, so maybe maybe this is kind of doxing him a little bit, but like Charles Finfrock of fame, Charles Finfrock of this. I'm a crypto evangelist. I love it, love it, love it. Oops. Listen. This, this is the same Finfrock. This, like, this is his face. This is Charles Finfrock. Charles Finfrock owns a company, okay? Charles Finfrock um, guest lectures every semester my Citadel class. He'll be guest lecturing actually on Thursday, November 16th, okay? At the beginning of the semester, I told all of my cadets, listen, in November, we're going to have a guest lecturer. The guy owns a company. The guy is always looking to hire an intern. He takes my opinion like very seriously about which of you, if any, or if multiple of you would be a good fit for him. Okay. And I just say that we go through the, the semester, my cadets, my cadets, right now I've had cadets ask me about internships, not even related to that. Like, Oh, how do I do it or whatever? And w there's one cadet in my course right now that has never asked about an internship, but he has demonstrated excellence commitment, hard work, initiative, proactivity, doing above and beyond engaging questions. And I talked to Charles the other day. I'm like, bro, I've got a nails candidate for you. And then after uh, class the other day, I walked with this particular person down the hall and I just said, Hey, listen, man, I don't know if you're interested, but are you interested in an internship? And he's like, absolutely. I'm like, all right, uh, two Thursdays from now, I'm going to introduce you to a guy. You take it from there. This is what I'm saying. Like, how you you like how you present, how you behave, what you do, the decisions you make, how you take professionalism, who you like, what you engage with, it has ripples. And you like the networking guys. I'm, that's what I'm saying. I say it all the time with networking. You can't, you can't like network with the idea that like, oh, I'm going to network with Jerry, and then I'm going to get a job because of Jerry. Oh, if I network really hard for the next 30 days. I'll get a job in 45 days. It's You can't look at networking as a input output transactional thing. It's it's a community. It's a, it's a living organism and you have to engage with it and it will just pay dividends. Believe me. All right. All right. So continuing to look uh, in chat here, I've got eight more minutes, y'all. Tim saying, thanks for the haiku videos. My pleasure, Tim. Blue teamer with five years experience interviewing for a junior pen testing role. Any advice for the career shift? Oh, good question, Tim. So definitely, uh, if it were me, Tim, um, obviously get your skills. Uh, two things I would tell you. One, if you're interested, uh, TCM Academy's PNPT and the training that follows the PNPT, I think is phenomenal. I think it's excellent training. And I think the PNPT is a legit cert that will enable you to be able to deliver actual pen testing services. Secondly, in your interviews, I would definitely obviously demonstrate your capability to do offsec, but I would, um, I would lean into your blue team stuff, guys, like purple team, Tim, purple team means a thing, right? So if you could say, Oh, Hey man, I've been a blue teamer for five years. I see these techniques. I know what threat actors are doing. I know how certain evasive techniques work. I know the type of fishes that can be sent. So I can be a more effective pen tester for you because I have been watching it from the defender's perspective. I know how a defender thinks and I know how to evade defenders. Hire me because I'm going to drop straight cash, homie. Straight cash, homie. And by, I just wanted to hit the sounder, but I'm going to drop bombs on you. <gasps> All right. Uh, let me keep going here. Um, oh wait, 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 Brittany Burnham says, I got in with Google IT and Google Cyber Course, but also I have teaching, marketing, org leadership experience. I'm in security awareness. That's another role. Absolutely. Way to go, Brittany. Guys, don't sleep on information security awareness. It's awesome. Breck Means says, if you had to choose between two starting roles, software implementation consultant, help desk, which would you choose? The consultant role pays thirty thousand dollars more. Um, I mean, dude, you know, thirty k is is not nothing, okay? 
Um, so the help desk is a great entry level feeder role. I guess I would do software implementation consultant uh, for a couple reasons. One, the thirty thousand dollars is hard to knock. Second of all, because it's software implementation, you can absolutely integrate security concepts like, oh, hey, here are baseline configs. Oh, hey, here are best practices. Hey, let's do a vulnerability scan after we deploy, right? So you can you can get that cybersecurity. Hold on one second. Um, Michael Romain got an interview today, just past CISP, October 19th. Woo! All right, hey, let, can, uh, let's take a screenshot of that really quick. Micah, I will answer if I can, but um, to your job interview in CISP, way to go. Um, so with the software implementation consultant, you can do all sorts of stuff. Plus as a consultant, you'll be talking to different businesses. So you might be able to network really effectively. Um, and again, 30 grand, it's 30 grand. Lee Mueller, I work in general cyber role. I do everything often tasked with GRC related tasks. Who doesn't love that? Can you talk a little supply chain resilience and how I can learn more? Ooh, well, with supply chain, I mean, there's third-party risk management. You can look into that. Uh, NIST CSF version 1.2 has an entire supply chain category that you can look into to see the controls that are good for managing supply chain. That's where I would start, Lee Mueller. That's the NIST CSF 1.2 and, and above, right? So I think maybe 2.0 came out. Um, and look at the supply chain section and then look at the controls that map into that. Um <sighs> All right, guys, I'm going to have to hold on. Let me tell Micah what's up. And then I got to go because um, I got this meeting in uh, three minutes with Gary. Um, Micah says, any advice on questions to ask the panel? All right. So, Micah, two things. One, I've got um, I've got a video or I actually have multiple videos on Simply Cyber YouTube channel on how to crush a job interview. Um, so I would absolutely look at that. OK, I know that's like such a BS answer, but the thing is, I can. If I tell you about the videos, you can get like an hour plus of uh, help with that question. Um, simply cyber interview or interview. Um, oh my God. So here is like a full in full analyst interview Q and a um, here's another Q and a um, here's a using chat GPT to crush it. Um, and then I did a video um, with um Stefan Semmelroth. Oh my God. That looks weird. Uh, Stefan Semmelroth. Let me see if it comes up. Yeah. I, I, uh, so here, here's a playlist, right. Of all these different videos. Look how young I look in this picture. Jesus, Jerry, just a wee, just a wee boy. Um, so here, here's the video, this one right here. This is complete cybersecurity job interview prep video. This will tell you all the questions you should ask the panel, okay? All right, guys, I got to get out of here. Um, thank you all so very much. You guys have been wonderful today. Thanks for all the super chats. Thanks for all the great engagement. Remember, next week is going to be a banger with all the different activities. I hope you can attend. If, if you're going to B-Sides Charleston, give me a high five while you're there. I'm Jerry, your chat. Until next time. Be secure. Later, everybody. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed